doing to myself in a group setting with other people who are also wanting to better their lives. That's, I think, in essence, what Deep is. It's a process where you, uh, you sit in a room with people with similar addictions, habits, and um, the counsellor leads you along to try and understand or enable you to understand why you do the things you do. Paramount for me acceptance around things, you know. I used to, you know, something's happened in life that's made you feel worthless. Situations like that, situations where you, you might perhaps try to re keep remembering something that was very hurtful and you, you've hidden it away in a dark room. I carried a lot of guilt around with me, you know. Around my dead son, you know, and... Going through the going through the process, I looked at it a lot different, you know. Sending for what it really was. It was a missing piece of the jigsaw for me. You know, I was ashamed. I was sexually abused when I was a child, and Steve Cross helped me get to the root of what my problem was. I carried a lot of blame. around me, the lads and the ladies who I'm in group with. Oh, I looked at it a lot different. Freeing. Freeing. It basically gave me a chance to to look at my behaviours, to look at um, to look at who I am at the core. And um, delve into the to the um, the parts of myself that I never wanted to acknowledge. It's one of the hardest programmes I've ever done. I'm 61 years old. Not all that long ago I was released from prison again. Obviously through the addiction. You know, it's always led me down the wrong pathway. And that's how my life has basically been, you know. I've always gone down that same road and expected to come out of a different place, which doesn't happen, does it, you know? The amount of stuff you do and like that, and the amount of thinking you do, it's just quite tiring. But you're getting a lot out of it, really. You know, at the beginning, I didn't think you gained a lot. I was like, oh, no, give this in, give this in, and like that. That just my head just wanted to give in. Obviously, more and more pushed through it, and I got out. I need to get out. Wait, it happened, really. It's, it's a very positive life-affirming, um, shared experience led by the best counsellors I've come across in my 21 years experience of people doing that kind of job. Extraordinary, really. Privilege to do. And I'm a very lucky person to have had the opportunity to go through it. I came into Deep because I'd had enough and I started working. Counsellors are good, but, you know, you do your daily feelings, etc. and 
They go down corridors. They can only go so, so far because you've got to like open the door and say, yeah, all right, this happened to me. And it makes me feel like X, Y, Z. And then they'll, they'll expand on that. They're very good. And that was what was the most significant part for me was when I realised I've got to let these things go. For me, it kicked in um, properly when I did my life story because until then I hadn't really tapped into the issues that I needed to and I think I was um, pretending to myself that I was letting out everything that needed to be let out and through the help of the counsellor in my group um, I finally felt that I had the courage to, um, to open up and when I did my life story it unveiled all of the um, the stuff that I'd kept in, and I finally got real with myself. So that was the most significant part of it for me, was opening up to other people about where I've been and my journey and uh, a lot of the self-destructive behaviours <clears throat> and secrets that I kept. The most significant part was writing a letter, and sometimes it's a grief letter, but for me it was a letter to a person living and I did end up in absolute tears. Um, and this is after having watched other people do their letters and after saying, dear dad, just falling apart, you know. I had to do a letter to my father who's passed away, which was very painful. When I was drinking, um, I had a rocky relationship with my father. Last couple of, couple of weeks or months, it's, it got worse and worse. It was yelling and, and I'm an only one. And, um, he passed away suddenly, massive heart attack. It left me with a feeling of, um, I had a lot I wanted to say. I couldn't apologise, it wasn't there. And I, I used that as a weapon against myself. I'd never spoke to anybody about it. I didn't want, you know, I, I just didn't want to go there. It was so painful. I'm so... Let's me, Dad. Obviously, I had a lot of resentment against him, and he just, I just died, like, that week. And I decided I wanted to write a letter. He died. That week I was finishing. I didn't really know him. You know, I've never, I've met him now and again. I never spoke to him. For that type of relationship, really. We've seen each other about, but never spoke. It's like you're letting these, letting something go, and you, and you have a, a real understanding and empathy, uh, really, with that person, but also through that person and through the piece of work, through the person you're writing your letter to, with the other people in the room, with your counsellors, and with all of your loved ones, um, wherever they might be. That resentment has gone, really. I was going to go to the phone, really, if like I did, and get out what I need to say to him, really. And the other one was a relationship with my daughter. Um, she's had her problems. Um, and a relationship, I was never there for her, but she needed me. My demon was drinking. That came before everybody and everything. Those combined with my life story, big, big steps, big steps. If you can get through that, be honest and truthful. Yeah, that's massive. The life story. Um, the loss and the chaos. You know, it was just loss, loss, loss all through my life, you know. And uh, I tried skirting over, you know, the really traumatic stuff. I come back and bit me on the arse, you know, because then the grief letters and writing to dead people. Most important piece of work, grief letters. The grief letters. You know, it was things I wanted to say to my granddad I could never have thought, never even thought about saying until I was guided, you know, through my counsellor to do these grief letters and how to do it and write it. And, you know, to thank him, you know, for all the years you know, when I was a kid, when I was coming up through me, through me abuse and stuff like that, my granddad was there 
But when when I saw my granddad at the time, I was 11 years old when I saw my granddad for the first time that I was being abused. And for six months afterwards, my granddad died, and I blamed myself because the day I saw my granddad that I was abused, Came broken. A lot. I've, I've seen that glint in his eye. Look, he, he loved me. He didn't love me any less. But he just, I just seen that. It, you know, it broke him. You know, it kind of. He felt defenseless. He was like my original superhero because he was there. He was the first person that showed me love. You know, and that it was okay to love. But when he died, it was. You know, I lost my way a little bit. You know, I was a very confused and a bitter person, you know, but deep sleep made me go through all, look at all them and look at my behaviours. You know, and actually, I can actually say, you know, thank you, Grandad, you know, for what you've done. I found it very emotional, you know. I've never, I've never cried for donkey's years, you know, proper tears for me. And I've cried for myself. You know, tears come down again. Poor me, say, you know what I mean? It's that many things been dug up from the past that you have to do while you're on this program. You know, it's very, very emotional. And it brings you in touch with your emotions, you know, and the real tears, not for myself. Because the damage I've caused over the years is unsurmountable, you know, it's hard to go there again. The life story is so intense. When I put pen to paper, I just kept writing and writing and writing, and I couldn't stop. Um, I'd forgotten about things that I'd done and um, experiences that I'd been through and through that that journey in my life story I was able to release that, that pain. Without it I don't think I would have embraced this process as much because you need to get to that place um, of honesty in order for your counsellor and your, and your peers to help you. It was so beneficial for me to do the life story. It was the most intense thing I, I think I've ever done in my life. Um, and it was scary, and I resisted doing it, but I did it. You know, but that's part of the programme. That's what we have to do, you know, to get well. I've always said to her, I'm not a bad person trying to get good. I'm a sick person trying to get well. <laughs> now to speak out and not only speak out to be, you know it's helped me to become the man I am now today I've changed I've changed changed the way I think now how's it's really helped me it's it's changed the way I'm thinking I realize I've been living in fear all my life you know uh, I had done time in the forces, you know, I'd done tours in Northern Ireland and all that back in the early days. Uh, and you have to wear this mask, you know, this thing. I always say I watch too many John Wayne films, you know, where the hero always wins, always gets the best woman, he always wins without any pain. Life's not like that, is it? You know, that's, a, that's just a picture. Deep has helped me accept me. I can't get in touch with me, basically, you know. Uh, today, I feel able to do that. It's given me the tools to go out in the world and know that I'm worthy of life, that I'm not a bad person, that I'm not alone, and um, that I can form a life for myself in the future. And the resentments of like that against a lot of family members and my grandma, my mum, and like that, they all seem to be at ease with them, and like that. I think it's helped me a lot. I had so many secrets, so much shame, so much guilt, and now I don't fear those things. I can now be my authentic self in front of others. It's very, very hard to put into words. It's helped me beyond words, really. I'm a very lucky man, very privileged to have had the chance to have one of those chairs. Not everybody survives the deep, and not everybody survives after at all. So it's not a guarantee, it's not, uh, it's not a kind of final 
<laughs> well done, you've graduated now. It's, it's just probably the first, round about the first 12 weeks in a, in a lifelong journey, and I'm ready to take that. I learned that I'm not a piece of shit, and I'm not worthless, and uh, I am worth something. I'm worth loving. Um, I can be a father. I can be a husband. And um, I could do things that I could never do. Without a drink. I'm not a monster, you know. I've learned that I am a monster when I pick that substance up, you know. Uh, I'm a loving and caring person, you know. For a long, long time, uh, I had self-loathing of myself through... A lot of it was through my sexual abuse when I was a kid. You know, I was led to believe that I was nothing. I found it very difficult, you know. I've been in... I was in a relationship with my girlfriend for five years, you know. Uh, she loved me with all her heart. You know, and I thought that was enough. And since I've let everything go and just concentrated on my recovery, you know, I look at myself in the morning, morning and I'm happy to say, you know, I'm happy with myself for the first time in a long, long time. That I'm human like anybody else and I have feelings. And that I'm allowed to express them feelings. You know, it's my right as a human being, you know. Uh, to express them feelings, whether it be right or wrong. We're all different, you know. I think uh, what I found out in addiction, we all come from different walks of life, different backgrounds, you know. Uh, but we all have that, I don't know if it's an illness, a sickness or what, that we have. Where once we start something, we can't stop, we can't just get off. I think the serious side to this is, it will kill you, our addiction eventually, if we stay in it. You know, it's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when. That mask has come off and I feel... I, I can listen to some people and some people say to me, oh, you, you are a nice, kind person. For years I didn't think that. I don't know, I thought people were just trying to get under, under the thumb, really. And now I do, I do believe it, but I can be that person. Uh, my life's done a 360, really, since Deep's finished. Um, I've now got opportunities coming my way. I'm trying to get a sense of identity. I can wake up in the morning without that fear and dread that I'm a... I'm a bad person. I can go out into the world, I can go to college, I can learn new skills. I can be... the person I was always meant to be. I am a productive member of society today, you know. Uh, well, there's doors opening for me now. Just need to keep a big wedge in them. Stop them slamming in my face. Taking care of yourself, eating properly, going to the gym, keeping fit, seeing other people, socialising, playing music, you know. I'm, I'm doing quite well there, aren't I? You know, there's enough things there to be focusing on and doing okay with rather than listening to the demon who wants to get you on your own and help you kill yourself. You know, and I feel quite safe and secure, you know, and not only that, you know, I'm a recovery coach at the moment and I never thought I'd be a recovery coach, you know, because for a lot, of, a lot of time I've been sold that, you know, because I couldn't read or write or spell properly, you know, I wasn't good enough. But now since I've come into a recovery coach, it's not about, you know, how good I write or what spelling mistakes I do, you know, it's people that believe in me and the passion that I've got about me in recovery and I feel that passion again. Keep myself busy, I do a bit of voluntary work. No light voluntary work, so I can't do anything. I get out of breath and go, walk up the stairs now. But that's part of old age, which I'm lucky. You know, there's so many people I know aren't here anymore through, through this addiction. You know, so I have been lucky. And I think jail's kept me alive in a sense. You know, I don't think I'd have been here now if no stints in prison that I've had. Uh, but I'm not going to say I'm grateful for that, <laughs> because I'd be lying. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's been.
been a long road. Probably to, to get my own place eventually, um, have my own family. So, you know, I've always wanted that, my own family, and to be working again full time. And yeah, like I said, freedom for everything, you know, freedom to just have, have a life. I just want to be able to um, live a life without fear and that I can um, sustain some sort of contentment. So I'm hoping, as I say, to go forward, go to college and help other people and give back. I want to rebuild my relationships. I've destroyed them, I've, you know. So, uh, yeah, I hope it, long, it continues long, long into the future. The most important things really would be around my family. My kids, my mum, um, my brother, my ex, wife. It's an important relationship. My future's just starting. It's just, it, my future's just starting. No, I've stopped running. That's all I've done all my life. And that's what Dee pointed out to me and all, you know. While I run away from home at an early age, you know. Uh, run away from schools, run away from relationships, run away from responsibility. It's time to stop running. can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, gotta cut you down. Sooner or later, gotta cut you down. Go tell that long-tongued liar, go and tell that midnight rider, tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell him that God's gonna cut him down. Tell them that God's gonna cut them down Well, my goodness gracious, let me tell you the news My head's been wet with the midnight dew I've been down on bended knee Talking to the man from Galilee He spoke to me with a voice so sweet I thought I heard the shuffle of angels sweet He called my name and my heart stood still when he said, John, go do my will.